Well, good afternoon again, everyone. I want to welcome you to um, this one-hour session. We, I think we, you know, it's it's you know, two o two p.m. So I think we will just get started. Um, we are. Um, my name is Rebecca Hassan, and I am the executive director of New York Executive Alliance. I am delighted to co-host this webinar titled "Navigating the Latin America Global Services Market: How to Choose the Right Sourcing Location" with Nia Group who will share their la latest findings on their LATAM research, and we will also have the opportunity to discuss such findings with a great and diverse by-side panel. So first of all, I, I, you know, I want to invite you to ask any questions throughout the, the presentation. Just type in your questions and we'll try to cover them um, during, during the session. Um, for now, let me introduce you to the panelists that will be providing their valuable insight for all of us today. Um, first is Tim Bilali. He is Vice President, Global SAP of Interpublic Group, where he is responsible for leading the technology for a major business transformation initiative for the $7 billion global advertising and marketing services company. Previous to Interpublic Group, Tim has held leadership positions with emphasis Craft Foods and Nabisco. Hello, everybody. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, also with us today is Adriana Castro, Senior Vice President of Customer Service for Citibank Latam Hub. Adriana has over 20 years of experience in the BPO industry, excelling at the implementation of solutions for customer service, sales, marketing, process reengineering, and technology. Due to her global best practices, she has been awarded by Citibank Corporation as the best performing country for five consecutive years. Um, Hi, everybody, and um, welcome. Welcome, Adriana. Um, our third panelist is Brian Tamposki, Vice President at Resources. Brian is a trusted advisor and well-regarded market leader in strategic sourcing and vendor governance. He specializes in optimizing organizational resources, both internally and externally, to improve efficiency and effectiveness of operations. And great to be with you all today. Thank you, Brian. Um, and of course, last but not least is Atul Vashista, who will be the moderator for today's session. Atul is the CEO of Neo Group, and he is recognized globally as an author, speaker, and leading expert on globalization. Atul is passionate about helping corporations create competitive advantage by leveraging global services and sourcing. Buenos dias, Rebecca. <laughs> Hi, Atul. Um, so again, we are very excited and appreciative of having all of you in the panel, and we look forward to a great discussion. And just right before I hand it over to Atul, um, I'd like to provide just a quick background on Nearshore Executive Alliance, NEA, uh, for those of you who are not yet familiar with us. So as I, as I mentioned before, uh, this webinar is being co-hosted by NEA and NEA Group. NEA is the industry association for the IT services and business process outsourcing sector in Latin America. We are a nonprofit organization founded by a broad selection of industry leaders with the objective of creating awareness of the capabilities of the region and increasing the use of the nearshore delivery model. So through different initiatives, such as you know, hosting webinars like this one, we present the advantages of LATAM as a service provider. So I think with that being said, um, and again, I invite you to ask any questions you would like to um, to ask during uh, throughout throughout the session. Um, I think I'm ready to get started and let Atul take over now. Wonderful, Rebecca. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm, and uh, as the CEO of Neo Group, I'm delighted that we're co-hosting this webinar. We are the Nearshore Executive Alliance, with which we're also members. And in fact, uh, everybody on the call, uh, the three by side speakers, are also members. Uh, before I begin, I just want to remind you again, you know, there's a question tab in your control panel. Please make sure you use that to uh, ask questions. And I also want to make sure that everybody is actually able to see the screen. So if you're not, either tell Rebecca to chat. And Rebecca, I cannot see the chat while I'm presenting, so feel free to tell me, you know, just uh, whether we need to change anything in terms of people being able to see the presentation. Okay, so what you're seeing is, you know, I won't take very much time on this. This just gives you an overview of Neo Group so you know where I'm coming from. We 
the company that I started back in 1999 advises global 2000 companies and fast growth companies on how to leverage global talent and global services. And we do that through our lifecycle advisory services where we help companies figure out what to source, where to source it, and how to manage it. But we also have a supply risk and opportunity real-time monitoring service called Supply Wisdom that companies can use in real time to monitor locations, which is country and cities, but also suppliers globally. And over 60 plus corporations belong to that subscription service. Enough of that. So one of the reasons I'm really excited about the agenda today is we happen to have three speakers other than me and of course Rebecca as the fifth person where the three by side speakers have varying levels of experience. Adrana actually sits in Colombia and spends a significant percentage of her time, by the way, not in Columbia, South Carolina. She, she sits in Bogota, Colombia, spends a significant amount of time in Mexico, Brazil, Peru, and, a number, and of course, Colombia, a number of other locations, and provides service, services to the city banks in that region from that location. So it has a lot of experience leveraging that particular location. At the same time, we have Brian Tempowski, who has been an advisor and out working for this large advertising company, advertising marketing company, Resources, and also has deep experience in sourcing globally and sourcing also from Latin America, including their own in-house center that happens to be in Costa Rica. And then we have on the panel, Tim Bilali. Tim is with a very large, again, advertising and marketing services company called Interpublic Group, or IPG. Tim has experience in sourcing, but primarily sourcing in the U.S. and from Asia. So Tim is considering Latin America for a number of different reasons. So what makes this panel really attractive is this different viewpoints that we are bringing to this panel. And then, of course, each of you in the audience has a perspective. So I'm hoping that not only do you ask questions, but you should feel free to share your comments, share your views as we go through this. And I'll do my best to ask your questions, answer the questions to, the, to our panelists and myself, but also share your viewpoints. So we're going to walk through some key considerations in location selection, the LATAM landscape and perspectives, and then how do you take action on location risk. Also keep in mind that right on your panel, you should also see a section called file, or sorry, it's called handouts, and you'll see a couple of different handouts, one on Neo, on Neo Group, and the other one is on the Nearshore Executive Alliance. And I look forward to the rest of the session as we go through this and dig deep into what makes LATAM an interesting location and how do, you, how do we think about it. So before we go further and start digging deeper into LATAM and what our panelists think about it, I have a question for all of us. So the question is, why are you considering Nearshore? So I know you come from a number of different um, considerations. Some of you are suppliers. Some of you are buyers. Other are advisors. So if you can go to the poll section, you should see a poll in progress. And what you have to do is pick one of those options. Pick the option of why do you consider nearshore? Was it a cost decision? Is it because you want to be more agile, same time zone kind of coverage? Is it about cultural context? Is it about business context? Or is there some other reason that you want to do it? Feel free to use the chat function or the question function to submit those ideas. So I think there's a number of you that haven't voted yet. I encourage you to vote um, so that all of us can share this viewpoint that you should hopefully be able to see on screen. Okay? So let me, I'm going to stop in about four seconds. So, so interestingly, you can see it right there that you know, 
people could pick, I'm assuming people could pick multiple answers because there really isn't a single reason why people do it. So this is really interesting, right? You know, often people talk about, you know, it's cost driving it. And, and I think, you know, many in the industry are recognizing that the reason for Nearshore is business context and cultural context second. And the whole same time zone and cost is, is important. You know, a third, of, a third of you, or that was one of the choices from a third of you, but more than half of you are saying that business context is critical, is the key. So, okay, with that context, let, let's move on to what we are seeing as companies are making decisions on, on locations. So, Tim, you just, you just saw the poll, right? in terms of how people kind of uh, suggested it or how, what they're thinking about what's important. You are new to LATAM, but you're not new to sourcing. Can you share your views on you specifically, Tim, as you think about it in your context, why would you consider LATAM? Sure, Tool. Um, so in, in my environment today, we currently use uh, several offshore partners in India. And, and the challenges that we have really focus in in, in a couple of different areas. One, and Atul talked about it a few minutes ago, but the time zone difference. Uh, what, what we see here at ITG is, is a real challenge around uh, burden, on our, burden on our resources on the East Coast. Uh, it, it's, it actually adds extra cost to, to, to the engagement with the offshore partners. Uh, our resources here are are consistently working their full day at work, and then they're also, uh, you know, going home uh, and spending extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary amount of time uh, with working with our offshore partners. Uh, so that one is the time zone difference. I think the second one is as we get into more and more of an agile development environment, where uh, the process is iterative, it's a challenge to do that uh, with that time zone difference. I think the other area for us is our engagement with offshore partners is it's not hundreds of people. Um, it, it's in the 30, 40, 50 people at this point. Um, and, and so we're not large. Uh, we're not a large account for some of our offshore partners. So we do have some challenges with attrition uh, and, and losing knowledgeable people that, that have spent, we spent some time getting them uh, trained on, on our systems. So those for, for IPG, those are really the areas where uh, I, opportunities that I see with moving things to nearshore. As the tool said, I'm just starting to look at this, and, and it really uh, presents an interesting opportunity for me. So, Tim, you talk about some really, you make some really interesting points, right? So often in the way development is changing requires people collaborating real time real time zone so right and then the second thing but I think this is an area that you mentioned Tim that people we see really underestimate which is the the impact the human resource impact which is the impact on how the team the team members in the US how their working hours change dramatically and how that impacts their the long you know the long working hours the early hours the late hours and the impact that has and how one starts to lose productivity over a period of time. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's, it, it's, it works short term, but as you go longer term, uh, multiple years, it really become, becomes a, a burden on, on our teams in New York, for example. Right. No, very, very much so. Thank, thank you, Tim. So what you're seeing in front of you is often, this is a location assessment framework that we use. You know, so when companies are looking at a location, a city or a country, they're not just looking at, hey, what is the cost structure? What is the salary structure? They're looking at a number of different factors because often these investments are not six-month or 12-month investments. They're looking at a long horizon. And I know, Adriana, for example, you and City, I mean, you particularly, as you look at LATAM, you work in different countries. Can you share your experience, you know, when you look at this, this assessment framework, Adriana, you know, what are, what are some of these factors that have stood out for you as you have dealt with different locations? Okay, thank you, Atul. Um, 
We have been working between all the countries in the Latin region. Uh, what we have found about this framework is um, most of the cities that we have been working um, with, uh, the most important thing is about the, the risk that we have found in the country. And that is related not only of the um, government stability because um, most of the country are in the in the same situation. It is about the labor low stability uh, because that made for us the difference about the um, labor pool and um, the good supply or skilled uh, labor people that we need uh, to get the productivity that uh, we are looking for. Uh, to give you an example, uh, for, um, if you compare some countries in the region, uh, most of them have difference of about uh, 10 to 15 labor hours uh, that we can work with them. So um, to give you an idea, for example, Venezuela and Argentina or maybe Salvador, you will need uh, at least 10 to 15 percent more people uh, to produce to get the same productivity. Um, in in this um, in this uh, factor that you will find in the in the framework, that is 40 percent of the financial uh, attractiveness. Uh, this labor cost is one. Uh, as a tool indicates, is 50% of the decision that we, when we work, um, that may have driven uh, the decision from one country to other. Um, the second one that I will mention is about taxes. Uh, taxes, when you compare, if you want to do a, one location for all your um, BPO or outsource, um, it will make the difference if you don't have um, a good uh, taxes advisor that allows you to uh, work with the with the different countries. Um, so um, that will you will need to take into account all these three factors that, for our experience, are. Um, the most important when you are uh, looking for the numbers to take the decision. You know, Adriana, thank you for that. You bring up, you, you actually uh, brought up a very subtle point that I want to make sure was not lost. Uh, when you heard Adriana start off, she said labor law stability. So it's not just about labor law that Adriana was referring to, she was also referring to the stability of the regime. What's happening in many countries is, particularly in Latin America, investors or companies who are looking to source want to understand what the law is, but also want to understand what is the stability. Is my cost going to become unpredictable? Or what is going to become unpredictable and what is going to remain predictable? That predictability is a huge factor. Like in Colombia, for example, they have something called legal stability contracts where if you make a certain size investment, a certain size, you know, commitment, then you are you are given a stable tax law status that even succeeding governments cannot change it. And so that provides investors a very stable outlook into the future. So thank you for that, Adriana. That was a very good subtle point that you made there. Thank you. So what you are seeing in front of you is actually uh, city assessment framework that was used by a large retail company when they were trying to decide which location in Latin America were they going to set up their next operation. Whether that operation was going to be in Sao Paulo, in San Jose, Costa Rica. So this was an actual model that they used that we helped them actually do. 
But before I go into it any further, I know, uh, Brian, you have significant experience in doing this, both as an advisor and now, you know, as part of the buy side. Brian, when you are looking at LATAM and when you have sourced it, whether it's your own center or your partners, can you talk about whether you use something similar or, and if yes or if not, what have you done? Yeah, Tool, you know, we certainly have, um, have leveraged a, a similar framework. I, th I think the one that uh, hopefully is shown uh, that others can see uh, certainly has many of the components um, that, I, that I think, you know, need to be evaluated for, um, you know, a sourcing decision uh, regardless of the location, but in this case uh, in Nearshore. And so, you know, certainly for depending on the type of business that, that you're doing, kind of the, the reason for establishing, let's say, uh, service offerings, right, in that uh, in the nearshore countries, uh, different characteristics may um, may be more relevant uh, than others, and certainly you know that's been the case uh, for us. Um, so we've looked at um, sourcing, you know, just like you would from a portfolio perspective. Uh, and when it comes to nearshore, um, as you stated, you know, at the uh, uh, in initial you know parts of the call. Uh, we look to Costa Rica uh, as part of our, our shared services operations. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Certainly education and some of these things, right, are outlined, I think, under your, your people category. Education and skills of the folks, language proficiency, um, it's just the overall stability of, of the country. It's, uh, you know, U.S. protected. Um, we found to be very compelling. And um, and that's you know why we established there, um, and we established a captive because we really knew that we wanted to take ownership of that of that operation you know right from the beginning. I'll say in other cases though, um, and maybe it's uh, you know in places like Colombia or other um, or other countries um, in Latin America where you know we probably wouldn't uh, take that bet. Um, maybe I would you know leverage a vendor. Right uh, to to kind of feel out uh, you know what's going on in that uh, country, both from a geopolitical economic situation, but also in terms of the skills and resources that are available uh, uh, to you. So uh, you know another example is in Costa Rica. We we also have a creative um, production team uh, that does some uh, great work for our agencies. And we've uh, we've also teamed up with a vendor to to do those services in in Bogota. So again, a vendor can help you establish you know those up, and then you can kind of make a decision from there whether you know that's something that you want to take captive within your operations or continue to leverage a third party. That's 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 good. And, you know, and Brian, one of the things you just talked about was not just the captive center, but also suppliers and what you are seeing on screen, hopefully everybody can see it, is how clients often think about the maturity of the suppliers, which often can be impacted by location because of the talent that's available, right? Is there, what kind of certifications exist? What is it metrics driven? Is there good training around process and process stability? What kind of technologies are being used? How, do, how does one thing about productivity you know, what kind of training and development programs are available. So um, what what will be good right now is, you know, Adriana or or Brian or Tim, it's, I don't know if you guys want to comment on kind of what you're seeing, hearing from suppliers and how some of that can be uh, impacted by location. I mean, hey, Brian, this is Tim. Just, I mean, from a technology, are there some countries which are better than others in, ter in terms of using technology as yeah. differentiators, yeah, uh, multiple skills, those types of things. Yeah, Tim, I think that's a so Tim, I think that's a great question, and you know, Brian, feel free to jump in, but just a couple of things. So many locations in Latin America, because of the cost of ERP and others, really were you know, it's like Brazil is a great example of somebody who very early on adopted open source technologies 
And so in many of these locations, open source talent is much more easily available than ERP. Now Brazil since then, since as the market has grown, the companies have grown, they have specifically focused on SAP and others, so you can find talent there. In fact, uh, Brazil has a company that's a billion dollar plus company that has great uh, SAP talent. And then the other thing that we've noticed is that because as the internet boom happened, many of these locations, they were not necessarily investing as much in technology, really caught on to that, really caught on to that. And so a lot of the newer technologies, whether it's Ruby on Rails or others, or other you know, CMS systems, you can find pockets of talent, mobile talent, for example, creative talent in places like Argentina, for sure. Um, I don't know if, if Brian, you, or Adriana, or Rebecca, for you, for that matter, want to add to that. I, I think I totally, I totally agree with you. If we if we think in terms of uh, Brazil or maybe Argentina and regarding the technology, uh, we can use technology as a differentiation. But uh, the point is when when you can have same technology, even the country that you are thinking about to for the best location in near shore. The, the differentiation or, or the best practice that, that you will find is about a skilled labor pool um, and quality. Why? Because any process, you can, you can do an implementation of any or optimize any process that you can um, implement in any country. And after that, you can get the productivity with the people. But if you don't have the, the human capital uh, and the talent people that are already training and develop, um, you will get uh, in trouble uh, with attrition, with uh, productivity, and some key indicators that are not going to be able um, to get the operation, uh, the maturity level or quality level that you deserve. So at the end, we have found a good experience with Mexico, also Brazil and Costa Rica. Um, in, in another scale, uh, you can have some for Colombia, Argentina, um, some countries in Central America like Salvador or Guatemala, but um, they have different scales. That, that's my point. Great. Thank you for that. So um, I apologize for some of the PowerPoint issue that happened. It's been figured out now. Uh, we will make this deck available to everybody. In fact, what I'll do is, um, in the, well, when we are wrapping the session up, I'm going to add it to the handout section. And so if you go to the handout section, you should be able to uh, get the, uh, this, this deck. And if not, you know, please, uh, you will be emailed at the very end, and you can always get it through that also. So let's move on to the next section. And I want to take a quick poll before we jump deeper to the next one. So what risks are you most concerned with? So when you, when you think about near shore, when you think about LATAM, I'd like you to answer which risks are you most concerned about? And if you look at your choices, you'll notice that the choices are crime, quality, instability, scale, and others. And feel free to please uh, give us your thoughts in the chat area if you have other that may not be on the top four. So please cast your vote, just selecting one of the following. Which risk are you most concerned with? I'm just, yeah, please, please keep voting. Uh, I just need a few more before I close in the next 10 seconds. You know, it's interesting. Whenever we talk to companies, um, risk is one of the key factors that people uh, can really talk about when, they, when it concerns Latin America, not that those risks don't exist in other locations. I'm going to close in two seconds. And let me share the results so you can see them. 
You know, so it's interesting, right? Um, instability is often seen as the number one reason, and this is why, you know, when Adriana talked about labor, labor law stability, people have similar issues about political stability, monetary stability, right? People have been concerned about monetary stability, for example, uh, in Argentina, they've been worried, they've been concerned about inflation in Brazil. And then quality and crime come up as the key reasons. What I'd like to do is um, I'm going to also invite uh, Rebecca from the Nearshore Executive Alliance because, Rebecca, I know that the Nearshore Executive Alliance also did a survey, and so I just want to walk people through these risk filters, and then I'm going to ask you to jump in and kind of talk through what the Nearshore Executive Alliance members said about some of the risk criteria. So I just wanted to show a model that the supply wisdom service that NEO has uses. And I think it's important uh, to look at this because often in the U.S. people have thought about risk as simply, oh, how stable is that country or what is the crime? But the reality is many times some of those issues don't affect you whatsoever. You know, people talk about the FARC in Colombia, for example. You know, I've personally made over 25 trips to Colombia. Adriana lives in Bogota, Colombia. Bogota is safer. The crime index of Bogota is safer than Atlanta, Washington, D.C. I, all of you to Colombia. I have uh, more than 24 participants. With a, for me, uh, it will be great. Even if you want, I can be your partner here uh, to show you how um, political stability have gives uh, give us um, some. Um, some uh, country that we are we are avoiding all the crimes that we have on the street. Um, you can you can be more safe uh, or you can feel more safe than Mexico City or maybe to um, Argentina or Sao Paulo. Um, yeah. What's the reason of this? Um, we have been working with a uh, lot of the stability and the government uh, to find out that we can uh, reduce the crime. So when people come to Colombia, um, the only risk is they want to stay here and they want to work here. So also they enjoy being here. Um, right. But but is 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 uh, as as full mentioned is is the same as you said I'm going to travel to Atlanta or to California and sometimes um, you can find more crime there um, but it's about perception uh, the yeah. same happened yeah. in for example Honduras. Um, and all the time they are publishing things about uh, guerrilla and song, the same in Colombia, but it's not the situation, the current situation that we have now. So you, yeah. all of you are more than welcome to come. Um, you have a partner here. <laughs> so th thank you, Adriana. So you know, what's, what's interesting to me is that scale did not come up as an issue, and we know that particularly when people are looking for English-speaking talent, that for some of the larger corporations, there is concern that in many of these markets, like San Jose, Costa Rica, for example, that there is a challenge in recruiting talent and the cost of talent is going up. So that's why I think it's important that when you take a look at risk, make sure you're not just looking at one factor, that you're looking at beyond crime, beyond instability, to take a look at some of the other factors that you can see from the supply wisdom model. 
I'm going to go to the next slide because I want to make sure we're able to we're able to uh, we're able to take in more content. Rebecca, can you make a comment about this NEA survey that was done with CXOs just very recently? Sure. So, so you know, it's interesting to see um, you know, the results we get from both of, of of the polls we did. So, this is a, a survey that NEA did with with six sourcing industry group, and we polled 85 C level executives, VPs, and outsourcing decision makers to learn about you know, their presence in Latin America and their plans for the region. So, when we asked them um, what the single greatest reason stopping them from including nearshore services into their global portfolios or stopping them from expanding their work with Latin American vendors and geographies, the results show that economic fluctuations is the main you know, single concern when you see um, with a 29.03% of their responses. Um, you know, under the others category, um, you know, this is not related to risk, but it's more, you know, it's the responses were lack of awareness and lack of, lack of focus on the region. So it's kind of a separate issue. Um, but, you know, as far as risks, we see the economic fluctuations, which, um, which is, it's, it, there's this kind of the same um, thing we just found about instability and um, the yeah. other ca categories, geopolitical risk with 16.13%. So. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you. I would like to mention uh, regarding economic fluctuation that, for example, when we have operation in Argentina or Venezuela, it's not only the index that we found for the inflation, it's also the labor environment that uh, make salaries increase, even that uh, the government define one uh, percentage of increase. They have to get more because of the labor union that they have or maybe because they don't have the political stability to define uh, how to increase the salary. So, uh, for example, for the last two years, we have increased salaries in Argentina for about 30 percent. Um, same happens in Venezuela. And um, if you if we compare with Brazil and about inflation, is one of the highest salary that we have in the region. So some countries are able to to speak Portuguese, and some operations at the from uh, Sao Paulo, for example, to to another uh, a small location between Brazil or abroad Brazil, near shore operation, um, because of salaries increase and inflation. So um, in Central America that uh, we have cheaper salaries, um, we don't have that problem because they work most of them with the dollars, so we don't have this kind of um, inflation problem. Right. So um, I'm going to get to some of the questions. Let me kind of switch for a little bit and just see the mood of the audience. You know, so when you think about a location, which locations are you most interested in? And I know I apologize in advance to any locations that you might be considering that's not on the list uh, because the, I could only put out four locations and the other, please use the chat feature to bring out any other locations that you're interested in, and they may not be on that list. So if you can please vote on what location is most important to you. I'm going to speed up a little bit because there's some content that I want to make sure that our panelists get a chance to comment on. So I think one of the one of the concerns um, that people have is, and I, you know, this is a question that's going to come up into the future. And Brian, you maybe I'll ask you to make a comment on that. Is that in some of these locations that their their laws are such that they don't make ITO and BPO successful because they're not meant. Like in Guatemala, for example. You cannot run shifts of any kind. In Costa Rica, you can run a two-hour shift, an eight-hour shift, six hours. 
you know, you name it, any kind of combination, but in Guatemala, you can't really do that. So do, do you run across the problem, and if, if yes, what role has it played uh, and, you know, in your decision making? Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't we haven't run into limitations a tool that have caused any you know real business problem uh, business process problems uh, to that extent. But I think the the points well taken in terms of understanding uh, labor laws and um, you know kind of the the landscape of of you know where you're operating. Um, you know, we've again tried to um, spread our risk. Uh, around in several uh, country locations um, and sometimes you know we've used vendors to do so so that where where we have uh, potential uh, limitations whether that be uh, in terms of overtime pay or hours or unions of that sort we have another avenue uh, to to go to so specifically I know we've we've had a, a vendor that's actually that we use offshore in India who has um, who has provided us resources in Uruguay and has provided us resources in Me Mexico as part of kind of our nearshore strategy. So we are we're balancing and, and kind of going going about our sourcing decisions in you know in multiple ways that kind of work I think for us and the skills and, and what we're looking for. Um, to to sort of you know maximize the capabilities in those countries and the efficiencies and return that we can get. Wonderful. So interestingly, um, Brian, some of the other countries that came up in the chat, so you can kind of see Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico stood out, but people mentioned also Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. So just just for people. So let me let me share some more content. And uh, Tim, I have a question for you. When you look at it, that's that's uh a significant number of year. So the labor pool there seems, seems uh, uh, attractive. Uh, go ahead, Atul, I'm okay. Go ahead. Yeah, Tim, I think what you were saying, I think that's interesting, right? I mean, I think since high graduation rates is a good indication in many cases of availability, you know, what, uh, what is important, I think, when people look at it is make sure you also understand what the utilization is because many times the labor markets in many of these locations get tight because of who else enters, you know, that, that location. And if I can, if I can just jump in real quick, re remember that at the end of the day, right, whether you're using a vendor or, again, it's part of your captive operation, the people that are, are you know working with you or for you right, are the most important thing to to your success. So there may be 250,000 people. I, I always talk to vendors about this. There, you may have 100,000 people right in your company, but I'm really worried about the 25 people right that are on our engagement. And so you know certainly you want to keep all these factors in mind. But again, at the end of the day. The people on your engagement are really the ones that are going to drive success for you. Yeah, so I think Brian, you're bringing up a point about you know good management doesn't replace whichever location you pick, right? The risks are different, but at the end of the day, good management uh, is necessary. Yeah. Yeah, but I I would like to add something to to what Brian mentioned is is about the attrition on those locations because sometimes uh, people wants to grow for the next level um, because of the engagement and the um, needs that the people have, people are going to be more stable in the operation, more engaged and committed. Um, in this way, you are going to have less attrition for them and uh, they are not uh, looking for the next job and looking for the, a better salary so they are going to move and move so fast uh, so that can make you some disruption with the services because you are losing people that is well training for you and they are not stable in the operation. 
So something that uh, we have found in, in Mexico with attrition in about uh, five, um, 50 to 60 percent in a year in some operation that is different from people from um, Colombia or maybe Nicaragua or Argentina that they 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 need to to get the job and they don't need to to move fast for the next um, job that it happened in Brazil or Mexico. Right. So thank you for that, Adriana. So what you just saw a couple of slides was one of the kind of like the hot spots. The next one was about the free trade zones. This one is about geopolitical risk, just the geopolitical risk more than anything else. And then a the next couple of slides kind of take you through some of the salary trends, some of the talent trends, you know, what's happening to compensation. And you can see that, you know, that there is a whole range depending on whether you are in Brazil as Adriana was talking about being very expensive to, you know, being in Peru where many of these are really very attractive to compensation. Um, you know, interestingly, many things that you, when I, when I talk about here, you know, we can use an example of where, you know, where Colombia is today in terms of security compared to where they were 10 years ago or where the police may be challenging in Nicaragua or the federales, you may have a challenge sometimes in Mexico, but if you just look simply at statistics, that in many locations are much safer today than they were 10 years ago, like Nicaragua, like Colombia, whereas the inflation in a, in a place like Argentina is significantly higher than where it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, then, and then the other thing to think about is the whole aspect which on this slide 18 that you are seeing is really about also, you know, what is the size of the talent pool? And how many people graduate every year? And is the headcount growing in the industry? Just because people graduate doesn't mean the idea of BPO is attractive. They could be going to retail. They could be going to banking. And then as Adriana and others were talking about, as Brian was talking about, and Tim is expressing what he wants, you know, how stable is the workforce in these areas? So I don't know, if, uh, Tim, when you look at this slide, for example, right, the attrition rate, you can see a whole range. And if you think about your experience in Asia, I think you'll see that the stability of the workforce is much higher in Latin America than you see in Asia Pacific. Do you have any comment on that, Tim? No, I, I mean, it, it looks like that. Obviously, I don't have that experience, but I, uh, the attrition rate is very important. Uh, one of the questions I have for, for Brian and Adriana is some of these countries, what's the work ethic like in these countries? I'm just curious in terms so, of... Uh, yeah. yeah. So Adriana, Brian, um, yeah. friend Rebecca, please feel free to jump in too. Did you hear the question? The question is, what is the work ethic between some of these countries, any examples would be helpful for uh, Tim to know about. Or anybody from the audience, please jump in through the question and answer section. For example, yeah, I think, in the work ethics uh, for the people, they are, um, they are willing to get some benefits from the company, more than ethics. So they, do, they are not able to move from one company to other because um, they get some, some benefits that make them to, to be for many years with one company for the, and it's the case in, in Colombia, also Nicaragua, and a little in Mexico. Uh, so that's, I will say like retention uh, fringes or benefits that may them to, to be with the company. In the case of Peru, that we see uh, a higher attrition in Peru is because of the regulation. It depends on the company that they work with. Uh, they, they can get some utility, um, um, 
I thought you would help me with this. Uh, is um, so, some benefits? When they get uh, from the EBIT of the company, they get a compensation for, for this topic. So yeah. uh, if, if, they, if they can move from one um, retail company to, into the uh, financial company, it's because they can get more uh, benefits uh, at the end in this company. It's, that's why they they move so fast from one company to the other. So you are learning productivity yeah. and training. And so. mm -hmm. Thank you, Adriana. You know it's interesting, um, Tim, and I love I love uh, Brian coming off to me. You know we when so you know just uh, one of one of our listeners in the audience has call centers in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Philippines, and their experience is that El Salvador has a much stronger work ethic, and they tend to stay long. Um, and there's, and then they're, they're having, in their call centers, they're having a little bit more of a challenge in some of the other locations. You know, I've, I've seen myself, for example, in, in uh, Colombia, a business person doesn't hesitate to have breakfast meeting at 7 in the morning. I mean, these are long hours, long days people put in, but again, what motivates them is what, you know, what we find uh, that people put in. Brian, do you want to comment? Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I would echo the same, right? Um, you know, it, in our operations in Latin America, you know, we have found, um, you know, very strong work ethic. But I think, again, it's, it's the cultural affinity, especially given the fact that resources in those areas are part of our, our company, our organization. So facilitating you know that and feel, you know feeling like they're part of uh, you know the larger global organization. You know again, it comes down to sort of management of those of those office places. But I but I you know you you bring up a, a a point that you know I think we need to start looking at you know even in the, in the U.S. right as it relates to work ethic in other parts of the the world. And you know I'm not a guy to count hours, but certainly. The, the cultural affinity and the willingness to sort of go above and beyond to try to um, to satisfy and aspire to um, you know uh, things that need to get done um, you know we, we, we see that a uh, very good sense of that in, in Latin America good. you know I think the I think the other thing that's important to think about and uh, one of our you know, one of our uh, attendees today who has significant presence all across Latin America and they do a lot of location-centric work, you know, his comment is that don't forget that if, when you think about many professions, like call centers, for example, in the U.S., it's very often that a contact center is recruiting from the bottom labor pool. And what, they, what he means by that is, you know, some, some of the best, are getting attracted to other industries, not necessarily the call centers, whereas in many of these locations, particularly across Latin, the young demographic, they're hiring from happens to be the top 50%, right? And often in many of these locations, whereas in the U.S. you might be hiring somebody with a high school degree, in many of these locations, often they're hiring with higher degrees into these centers. Yeah. And I think the same thing, you know, we're starting to see in some of the other outsourcing industries like technology. So I think there are, there are other factors at work that you have to think beyond the surface to say, you know, what kind of people does this industry attract in the location that I'm going to hire for or I'm going to have one of my partners leverage. So Benjo and uh, Jeff, thank you for those comments. As we're coming to an end, let me switch because there's a couple of things I just wanted to kind of have a conversation around. And again, uh, from the audience, please ask questions, make comments. You know, many of you have been very generous in sharing your viewpoints. Please do that, not just questions. I appreciate it. So the final poll is how does, you know, what suppliers are you using? And this is really, I just wanted to know, any of you wanted to know, you know, what suppliers come to mind? These are some of the largest suppliers that we have up there. Globan from Argentina, Civit, Stefanini, and CNT actually happen to be from Brazil, but they are global companies. And then other, you know, just please ask, you know, who, who else? And we just wanted to see 
name awareness that exists in the audience because I often find, you know, our clients, Neo Group, supply with some clients are typically global 2000 companies and when I'm talking to them, you know, other than the U.S. majors like IBM and Accenture, they're not really aware of the regional companies. Interestingly, these are not regional companies. They have very strong presence across the globe and particularly in the U.S. So I'll, I'll, I'll love, I'm going to keep it open for another five seconds before I close it. And then I'll read out, okay. So interestingly, you know, people know of Stefanini. That's interesting because Stefanini is one of the largest companies. Stefanini is a billion dollar plus company, global company based out of Brazil. And then you can see uh, CIMT and Globan. Globan is doing some fantastic work. CIMT is doing some fantastic work as it comes, as it focuses on, they focus on the digital space. And uh, uh, we, I personally do no business with any supplier because we only focus on the buy side, so none of this is an advertisement for anybody. And then um, we are hearing, uh, for example, Softec, fantastic. Softec is one of our board members of the Nearshore Executive Alliance. They do tremendous work across uh, Latin America and, of course, in the U.S. Then there's other companies that people are mentioning like InContax and Santex and, of course, uh, Neoris and others, Uno Square in Mexico. So a number of good companies that are not just the large companies that I put up there, but also companies that are 200 people or somewhere in that range that are really doing very good work. So let me close that poll as we get to the final slide. And I'm hoping uh, we have some final questions and the final comments as we're wrapping this up. So really in conclusion, and I really, you know, please uh, to our panelists today, anybody please jump in. Uh, but in conclusion, as we think about, you know, how one selects the right LATAM location, you know, we could have spent hours here today talking about each location, right? But I wanted to give you a view that we, as, a, as the five panelists on this, think about from a demand and supply perspective. Demand perspective, you know, you've got to ask the question, how does it align to my corporate strategy? And I think, you know, Tim, for example, talked about some of that, about how they care about their people, how they're, how they're working in an agile environment. You know, how, does it, how do they think about it from a corporate strategy? You know, Brian and Adriana talked about the scale and skill requirement. You know, where does scale exist? Where does skill exist? How to think about risk? What is your risk tolerance? How do you think about what you own, what you source? Where do you build your capability? And then I think the one thing that stood out when we did our preparatory call was it's about balancing, about taking a portfolio approach. What do I do myself? What do I do in Asia Pacific? But what do I do in Latin? What is the best for me to do there? So it's about balancing the portfolio. Does anybody want to comment on the demand side? Awesome. And then on the supply side, you know, it's about understanding the unique opportunities in the area. I think you heard from some of our attendees talk about the attrition that they're seeing, the work ethic that they're seeing, where they're, which labor pool they're, they're recruiting from. You know, that really matters, right? That, so understanding that, understanding the challenges. And then how do those, those compare to each other, what matters, so that you have clear understanding of the total return on investment. So unfortunately, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our session. And so before we end, some of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to be able to give you a chance to be able to take a look at all the material that's here. And in fact, um, as I'm talking to you, I am taking the opportunity to upload the final deck so I want to make sure that all of you take a look at the handout section. And what you will find in the handout section are three handouts. Handouts, it's about NEA. It's about your group brief. And then there's a LATAM overview webinar. And you should be able to take a look at them and download them. I also encourage you to reach out to Rebecca, who is the Executive Director of the Nearshore Executive Alliance. If you're interested in the Nearshore Executive Alliance, if you're interested in LATAM, you ought to be a member 
of the New Yorkshire Executive Alliance. So her email address is right there. If you have any question on the data, please feel free to reach out to us at info at neogroup.com and I'll be happy to provide you any more detail or provide any explanations. Now, most importantly, I want to thank Tim Bilali, Brian Kampowski, Adriana Castro for being our buy side panelists. Thank you, Tim, Adriana, and Brian for providing us expertise. It's greatly appreciated. <laughs> Rebecca, thank you for hosting this webinar on behalf of the Nearshore Executive Alliance, and this is a tool on behalf of Neo Group. Thank you, everybody. Uh, you have the email addresses. Feel free to provide us any feedback, um, any comments, any thoughts are greatly appreciated. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of the week. Thank you to everybody. Have a great day.